Hey everyone, Keegan here with Dark Arrow. In this video, we'll be drop testing the nose gear of the Dark Arrow 1 prototype. We've built up a test rig, loaded that test rig with weight, and hoisted it above the ground. All that's left to do is to drop it. The goal here will be to simulate a bad landing in a safe and controlled manner so that we can verify that our gear will perform as expected before we get into flight testing. Leading up to this, there's been a lot of engineering effort, which has brought us to the design that you see here. So before we drop the nose gear to see how it performs, let's take a closer look at the gear design itself, the test rig, and discuss the importance of this test. To better understand the design of the gear, it's important to first understand the mission of the Dark Arrow 1, which is high speed, long range, efficient flight. Retractable landing gear help us accomplish this mission because they improve aerodynamics, which allows the aircraft to fly faster while consuming less fuel. How the landing gear is mounted to the airframe is important. The two most common arrangements are either a tail dragger configuration with two main wheels up front and one small wheel in back, or a tricycle configuration with one wheel up front and two main gear positioned behind the forward wheel. The main gear can either be mounted on the fuselage or the wing. Mounting the main gear to the fuselage as opposed to the wing helps keep the wing aerodynamically clean. Mounting the main gear onto the fuselage also avoids additional structure in the wing, which helps free up more space for fuel, allowing for more range. We don't have space to retract the main gear with a tail dragger arrangement, which leads us to a tricycle configuration. For good ground handling and landing characteristics, the landing gear wheels should be positioned so that anywhere from 80 to 90% of the aircraft's weight is carried by the main gear, and 10 to 20% is carried by the nose gear. But determining the gear configuration and wheel position is just the first step in engineering the landing gear. So let's look at some other engineering considerations. The design of the landing gear is much more than just a strut and a wheel. The nose gear in particular must satisfy a whole range of requirements, many being in conflict with one another. For example, it has to be strong enough to handle worst case landing conditions, but it also has to be lightweight. The gear needs to absorb and dissipate the energy from hard landings while remaining compact enough to retract back into the fuselage. The gear should be designed to reduce the potential for failure, but also include some level of redundancy to account for select failures. It has to allow the aircraft to be steerable on the ground, but then remain straight when retracted. It has to be manufacturable, serviceable, and maintainable over time. These list of requirements go on. All of these requirements meant that there wasn't an off-the-shelf landing gear solution we could use from an existing aircraft, so we had to design our own from the ground up. I won't have time to go into the details on every component of the gear, but there are a few features I thought were worth pointing out. One of the key ways of meeting the energy absorption requirements involves an off-the-shelf shock absorber, which is housed inside the forward and aft turning halves and the strut tube. This lightweight shock is able to properly absorb and dissipate the energy from a hard landing. When I say dissipate energy, I mean that it isn't going to act like a pogo stick and bounce the airplane. Now by integrating the shock inside the landing gear structure, we keep everything compact while still allowing enough room for it to be retractable. It also means that the primary gear components do not require super tight tolerances or high pressure seals integrated into the housing structure. Instead, we can just use simple bearings in combination with this strut tube. This way the shock can remain protected from prop wash, rain, dust, and debris and do its job reliably, while the outer structure of the trunning halves and the strut tube can do their job of taking up any bending or side loads. This approach also helps make the gear more serviceable and maintainable over time. If anything goes wrong with the shock, you can just swap it out. We went through many different design iterations with the landing gear, and we managed it all through Onshape. Onshape has been our CAD tool of choice for the Dark Arrow project. There are a lot of features we like about Onshape, like the fact that it doesn't require any software downloads. It works basically on any device with an internet connection. It also eliminates the need for individual part files, which can become cumbersome to manage. Because it is accessed through the web and is continuously updated and getting better, you are always using the latest version of the tool. Any new functionality is available to use immediately rather than having to purchase a new addition to see improvements. One of the features we used a lot on the landing gear design was their integrated FEA tool, which allowed us to simulate landing loads and look at stresses and deflections in different landing gear components. Basically, we could test the landing gear in the virtual world so we didn't have to break them in the real world. If you'd like to design and analyze your own parts in Onshape, you can get started for free using the link in the description. Even though we did all this engineering, design, and analysis work, we still need to verify that the gear performs as expected in the real world. This is where testing comes in. 
Although the Dark Arrow 1 is an experimental aircraft, much of the design is still engineered to meet the same FAA requirements for certified aircraft. Emergency landing conditions are a big part of landing gear testing. We want to prove that it will not fail due to a hard landing condition. To conduct this test properly and meet the requirements specified by Part 23, we'll need to drop the gear at a specified height and weight, which will be based on the gross weight and wing area of the Dark Arrow 1. We'll also need to simulate a drag load, which is the aft load that is experienced by the wheel and tire when they make contact with the ground. More on how we'll do that later. What we'll be looking for is this, proper compression of our shock. We want to see nearly full compression, but we don't want it bottoming out. Like an airbag, we want our shock to absorb as much of our impact load as it can to minimize the forces experienced by the rest of the gear strut, airframe, and occupants. We also want to see that the landing gear hardware components handle the landing loads without experiencing any permanent deformation or yielding. And lastly, we want to see that the gear is properly dissipating the absorbed energy and damping out any rebound. Although not part of the FAA requirements, we want to make sure that the landing gear does not return the absorbed energy to the airframe like a compressed spring, causing the airplane to bounce on landing. All right, let's look at the test rig. This is our drop test rig. It allows us to drop the gear in a controlled manner by pivoting it here at the back end and allowing the end with the gear to swing to the ground. We can raise and lower the stand to the desired height using this hoist. And with this engine box, we can add sandbags until we get the full weight needed. Using this weighted box over the actual engine also means that we can avoid damaging the engine in case something were to go wrong. We opted for this approach over a pure vertical drop test stand because it was easier and quicker to set up. A small but notable part of this setup is in this rubber slip fit ring. So as the shock compresses, the upper trunnions will push on the rubber ring and slide it down the strut tube. This will allow us to measure the total shock compression. One last critical piece of this test setup is the wheel drag load simulator. We want to simulate the tire spinning up when it makes contact with the ground. This generates an aft load on the wheel, pulling it back. But since our ground isn't moving, we'll need to move the wheel instead. The trick here is to spin the wheel backwards so that when it makes contact with the ground and stops, it pulls the wheel back in the same way that it would in a real world landing. To get the wheel up to speed, we are using this AC motor with a voltage regulator. And we have them both mounted on wheels so we can roll it out of the way before we drop the gear. So this test setup allows us to simulate all the key elements of a hard landing, but to do so safely while on the ground and at the same time be able to more accurately record data and study how the gear responds. With everything in position, I think we're ready to conduct this test. Let's drop this thing and see how it performs. The final drop test went well and the landing gear performed as predicted. After thorough inspection of the components, we didn't find any yielding or deformation. Leading up to the final drop test, we conducted several smaller tests with less weight and lower drop heights. By creeping up on the final drop height and weight, we were able to study the shock response and make small adjustments to the shock pressure based on how things were trending. We wanted the shock set up so that it compresses through the majority of travel at the worst case landing condition. One side benefit of this gradual progression to the final drop height was making sure that the drop test rig could survive as well. In fact, leading up to the final drop height, we actually broke the rig and had to repair it before the final test. These lower drop heights are more representative of normal landings and the response was what we were seeking. We're looking for the shock to compress and stick to the ground rather than bouncing. This means that the gear is absorbing the landing energy and dissipating it rather than springing back. And while the FAA does not explicitly specify how landing gear should dissipate landing loads, we believe that incorporating a damping mechanism to minimize bouncing should be considered an essential safety requirement. A design around a single piece strut with no shock or even a spring style shock that has little ability to dissipate landing energy and dampen rebound would not have been acceptable for the Dark Era 1. 
These designs are some of the least efficient and least safe ways to dissipate hard landing loads. It's exciting being at this point with the landing gear. This milestone represents the completion of the bulk of the engineering work with the nose gear. And with Riley and River wrapping up work on the main gear retract mechanisms, we'll be moving on to the main gear drop testing, but we'll save that for another video. Thank you all for watching and we'll catch you in the next one.